11, Matthew 11, verse 7, the Bible reads, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? The title of the sermon tonight is Into the Wilderness. We'll have a look at what this, what this phrase is about. What does it mean to go into the wilderness? What did these people aim to see when they went into the wilderness? So let's, look, let's pick it up from verse number 1 there. Matthew 11, verse 1, the Bible reads, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Just the first thing that I want to point there, verse number one kind of feels like it's part of the previous chapter. It kind of is because Jesus Christ sends out his 12 apostles into every city. He gives them power to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to go and preach the gospel. So he sends out his 12. But even though he sends out his 12, we see that Jesus himself departs thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now let me say something about this, okay? If we look at Jesus Christ as our ultimate example, if we look at Jesus Christ as the chief shepherd, as the good shepherd, all right, as, as it were, the pastor, the pastor of the sheep, even though he sends his 12 to go and preach the gospel, he himself goes out into every city, into every town to teach and to preach. All right. So when I look at a passage like this, I'm encouraged as a pastor, not only should I be telling people to go out and do the great works of God, not only should I tell my congregation the need to go and preach the gospel, but if I'm not doing that, if I'm not setting a good example within my own church, then I'm not, doing, I'm not following the steps that Jesus Christ has left us here in verse number one. But let's keep reading verse number two. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. You see, John, the John here is referencing John the Baptist. And we know about John the Baptist. He came and prepared the way of the Lord. He came and prepared the way for Jesus Christ, that many would come and believe on Jesus Christ. And we see, we pick it up here, that he's in prison. We see this great prophet of God in prison. And we know what the reason for that is. If you know, okay, Herod the Tetrarch, or Herod, his name is also Herod Antipas, you know, John the Baptist had preached against him because he took his brother's wife and he preaches against him. So Herod takes him and puts him into prison because he doesn't want to hear the word of God. Now, if you're curious about who this Herod is, this is the son of Herod the Great. And if you remember who Herod the Great was at the birth of Christ, Herod the Great tried to kill baby Jesus. Remember that? When, when, he, when, he, when he put in order to kill all the children that were two years old and under, that was Herod the Great. He ends up dying, if you remember, when, they, when, when Joseph takes his family to Egypt. And so they come back out of Egypt. But this is now Herod, the, uh, the Tetrarch, his son. He'd taken his, his brother Philip's wife. And so we see John the Baptist in prison. It says there in verse number three, And said unto him, this is, this is the message that John the Baptist is sending to Jesus Christ. And he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, John the Baptist came to, to prepare the way of the Lord. And now we have John the Baptist in prison. He's discouraged and he's asking Christ, are you the Christ? Are you the one that I came to prepare the way for? And what I want to bring to your attention there though, even though John the Baptist is a great man, and yes, in the, in the following chapter, a chapter we'll see how great this man was, but even he, in the face of persecution, even here, here, um, he being thrown into prison, had doubts of Christ. Even he got to a point where he got discouraged, he got backslidden, and he didn't know, is this true, the Christ that I had come to prepare the way? And let me just tell you this, you might find yourself in a position where you're discouraged. You might find yourself not reading your Bible anymore, not truly seeking the Lord. He seems so far away and you're wondering, why is the Lord so far? What, you know, what is wrong with me? Am I saved? And you start asking these questions, you start having doubts about your faith. But let me say, this is normal. This is a normal part of life. And this is why God gives us the example of John the Baptist, a great prophet of God. And even he had doubts, you know. And uh, let's keep reading there in verse number four. How does Jesus reply to, reply to the disciples of John the Baptist? It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, what I love about verse number five, okay, is this. You might not ever 
help a blind man see, like physically. Okay, you don't, you don't, Jesus Christ has not given you those powers. Okay, you may never see the lame walk, you may never cleanse the leper, you may never make the deaf hear, you may never raise the dead, as it were. But one thing you can definitely do in this list is right at the end of it, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So, Jesus Christ, even amongst all these great miracles of healing the sick and doing all these things, Jesus Christ names preaching the gospel among that, okay? So I don't want you to ever feel like, man, I wish I had these powers. Look, you have a great responsibility. Christ has given you the gospel to preach to your family, to your friends, to the neighborhood, and that's just as mighty as the works of raising the dead and, and you know, making the blind to see and all these other things, guys. You've been given a great privilege to do the works of God of preaching the gospel. And this is how Christ, this is what Christ uses to encourage John the Baptist. Hey, I am the one that, that is Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the one you've come to prepare the way. Look at these amazing works that we've done. All right. Now, if you're wondering what is Jesus Christ quoting, you don't need to turn though. I'll read it to you quickly. He's quoting the book of Isaiah. I'll just read it to you. It's Isaiah 29 verse 18. It says, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of, out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase the joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Hey, who's the Holy One of Israel? That's Jesus Christ. You see these poor rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have the context of the New Testament. They're rejoicing because they've had the gospel preached out to them. They've believed on Christ. They've been saved. They know their eternal home in heaven. And so what Jesus Christ is telling John the Baptist, hey, this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. This is a fulfillment of what Isaiah spoke about. Yes, I'm a fulfillment of that prophecy, but so are you, John the Baptist. He's encouraging John the Baptist. Look at verse number six. And then he says, and blessed, yeah, we're reading from Matthew 11, guys, if you want to turn there. Matthew 11, verse six, it says, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So saying, John the Baptist, look, don't be offended. And yes, John the Baptist was offended. He was in prison. You know, he thought he's doing the great works of God. Why do I find myself here? But here's a reality, guys, of the Word of God. We must be believers that are non-compromising when it comes to the Word of God. You know, I've got to be a pastor, a preacher that will not compromise what the Word of God says. If that means I could potentially be cast into prison for preaching the Bible, then so be it. Now, my flesh doesn't want to say that. Okay, in my flesh, I'd rather be protected. I'd rather always know that I'm safe, okay? I, I don't want to be thrown into prison in my flesh, okay? But this, the new man, the Spirit of God that indwells in us, it wants the Word of God preached without compromise. It wants the Word of God preached even if, if it offends the authorities, even if it means it brings persecution against, um, amongst believers, so be it, okay? This is a reality of the, of the Scriptures. Hey, we've been given the great privilege of our sins forgiven, eternal homes in heaven. You know, if, if we're cast into prison for the Word of God, look, it's just a temporal thing. You know, the things that matter are what's eternal, the rewards in heaven that God has prepared for us. So he's encouraging Don, John the Baptist in verse 6, don't be offended in me, John. And then verse number 7, look, look at verse number 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John. So just in case these multitudes are like, man, this John the Baptist has really failed the Lord, man. You know, well, well, why is he doubting? Why is, what's going on? Just in case here, we see how Jesus uplifts John the Baptist. Okay, look at it. verse number 7. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? So Jesus here tells the multitudes, because a lot of them, were disciples, were followers, were listeners of John the Baptist. And John came preparing the way of the Lord. He pointed them to Christ. So then they went from John the Baptist and went following Christ. It's a great thing, okay? So he goes, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? Why would you go into the wilderness? It's a place without luxuries. It's a place that's lacking food and, and, and resources. Why would you go out there, he says. And he says, a reed to see, a, a reed shaking in the wind. Did you just go to the wilderness to look at a, a wheat that's been moved by the wind? Is that what you went to see? You know, and what I'm reminded of here is that John the Baptist is not, obviously he's not the reed shaking in the wind. Okay? And as believers, as preachers of the word of God, we ought not to be people that is tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Hey, we ought to be believers that are established, that are strong, 
That, hey, you may need to hear some wilderness preach in your life. You may need to hear some rough preach in your life. But hey, it's the rough preaching, it's the wilderness preaching that can change your lives. It's the wilderness preaching that will help you mature and grow and be a greater Christian. Let's keep reading verse number seven. Uh, sorry, verse number eight. And what went, went ye out to see? Why did you go into the wilderness? They're talking about John the Baptist. A man clothed in soft raiment? Did you go to the wilderness to see a man clothed in soft clothing? You know, silky clothes, you know, fancy clothes. Is that the guy you went to see in the wilderness? No, it says, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. Hey, it's the, it's the rich, it's the powerful, it's, 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 it's the king's and, and the king's house that wears the soft clothing. You didn't go and see him. Hey, how was John the Baptist dressed? Remember, he had camel skin. He had a, a leather a girdle, a leather belt. You know, around him, you know, he was, a, he was a wild man, a rough man. He ate uh, honey and, and locusts. I mean, this guy ate insects, okay, for his nourishment. This, I mean, I don't know how many of you, I, I've been to, I've been to uh, Bangkok in Thailand and, uh, for, for work. And, you know, on the, on the streets, they sell insects, you know, to eat. It's like, you know, and, and they challenged me, can you eat this? I'm like, no, I'm not going to eat that. And, uh, we had a challenge for work, like a team a team building, team bonding thing. And I, wouldn't, I, I just pretended to eat it. I didn't eat it. I couldn't do it. And I just, I'm just not as rough as John the Baptist. But I've got, to, I've got to work toward that, okay? I've got to work to that. But this is John the Baptist doing great works of God, a rough man, eating insects, eating honey. And uh, let's keep reading there, verse number nine. But what when ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. This, guy's even, uh, uh, this, this man that you came to see is a great prophet. And yet he's a prophet of the, of the wilderness, okay? He doesn't have the luxurious church building. He doesn't have the luxurious clothing. He doesn't have the long robes, okay? But you went out to see him because you wanted to hear the preaching of God's word. You wanted to see someone strong. You wanted to see, hear some wilderness preaching. You wanted to, to know who the Christ was and he, he pointed you to, to me. You went there to get baptized and do all these things. And then he says in verse number 10, for this is he... Of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, what I want you to do, guys, is keep your finger there in, in Matthew and turn to Malachi chapter 3, please. Turn to Malachi chapter 3. This is really, this is really important if you can turn there. Malachi chapter 3. Okay, Malachi chapter 3. Because what is Jesus speaking about here in verse number 10? I'll just read verse number 10 again. For this is he of whom it is written... Where is it written? Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, I just want you to notice what Malachi 3, 1 says. Look at this. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Who? Let's read it again. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye, speak, ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Hey, who did John the Baptist come to prepare the way for? The way of God, of me, God says, of me. And Jesus Christ is quoting this from the book of Malachi here in Matthew chapter, what are we, chapter, I'm getting confused guys, 11. Matthew chapter 11. And uh, so... So he, he's, he's telling the people, hey, John the Baptist was this prophesied messenger and he came preparing the way of God. Okay, this is Jesus Christ um, affirming his deity, affirming that he is the Lord God Almighty. Okay, so we see that Jesus Christ lifts up John the Baptist. And the one thing I want you to understand here is that John the Baptist was depressed. He was down. He had doubts. But how does Jesus respond? Does Jesus criticize him? They say, John the Baptist, you're an, you're an idiot. Why are you discouraged? Why are you let down? No. You see, he encourages John the Baptist. He speaks well of him. And guys, the same thing for you. You know, you and your spiritual walk might be let down. You might be discouraged. You might be backslidden. And you might be ashamed to come before the Lord and say, Lord, help me, encourage me. But it's exactly what God wants to do for you. It's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to encourage you and speak well of you, speak highly of you, okay? He wants you back on your feet, encouraged, preparing yourselves, preparing the way of the Lord. Hey, yourselves doing the work that God has left us to do, okay? We've all been given work by our Lord God to accomplish. 
And look at verse number 11. Go back to Matthew, Matthew 11, please. Verse number 11. Matthew 11, verse 11. And look, look what Jesus says about John the Baptist. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's amazing words. All right? I mean, among them that are born of women, that's all the men that have ever existed, of all the people that have ever existed, he says John the Baptist is the greatest. Okay? And there we have John the Baptist in prison. Okay? But he's in prison for preaching the word of God. All right? Now, look what it says here. And some people struggle with the, with the second part of this verse. It says, Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, some people get this confused. But let me explain this very simply, okay? John the Baptist, the greatest man that ever lived, as far as Jesus Christ is concerned, okay? The, the greatest man, you can be greater than him. Okay? And how? He said, how can I be greater than him? By just being the least. By just by being the least in the kingdom of, of heaven, okay? Say, so, look, if all you do in your life is get saved, you hear the gospel, you get saved, you have, you, you, you know, you have the foundation of Christ in your life, you know what? When you get to heaven, you're going to have the greater riches, you're going to have greater honor, you're going to have a greater life than the great things you can accomplish on this earth, okay? So I want you to think about this perspective. It's not saying that John the Baptist is the least in the kingdom of heaven. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying... The, being the least in heaven is better than all the success you can have in this life. Okay, that's what it's saying. So, of course, look, I don't think any of us, if John the Baptist by Jesus' standard is the best, I don't think any of us are going to be greater than John the Baptist in heaven. Okay, but being the least is still better than being like the best pastor on, on this earth. Okay, this, this temporary life that we have in comparison to eternity is, is very small. It's, it's very insignificant, okay? But this is why God has given us our lives so we can focus on eternity. So we can be, wow, this is going to be awesome in heaven and build our treasures there. That our focus would not be on just temporal things. We wouldn't be just be focusing on how much money we can make in this life, but we can be focusing on, how, on, on the treasures that we can have in heaven. Because that's where it's going to matter. That's where, that's where eternity is. That's what matters in the long run, okay? Heaven. Verse number 12. And verse number 12, guys... Uh, I don't know. I'm going to give you my best shot at this, all right? Verse number 12. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Verse number 12 for me has been something I've only learned a few months ago, okay? But look at, look at verse number 12. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffer violence, and the violent take it by force. I say, what is that about? Okay, now I'll give you just one quick thing that I've heard. People struggle with this verse a lot, okay? Now, now that I understand it, I don't think it's that confusing, but people really struggle with this. One teaching I've heard is they're talking about the Roman Empire. They're saying the kingdom of heaven, that's the kingdom of Israel. And, you know, since, John, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven or Israel uh, suffers violence because of the Roman Empire being, being under the authority of the, of the Gentile nations. That's something that I've heard, but that makes no sense at all, okay? The reason it doesn't make any sense, it says... Verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist, okay? So the Roman Empire, if you know your history, before John the Baptist, they were already, they already had control over that land, okay? So it doesn't make sense that it's from the days of John the Baptist. But I think the key here to understand here in verse 13 is this. It says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, okay? Now, verse 13, when it says, for all the prophets and the law, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Old Testament Scripture, okay? The Old Testament Scripture. There's two ways to look at this. That um, the Old Testament Scriptures, and it, um, we know that uh, at the end of the Old Testament, it prophesies of John the Baptist coming into the world to prepare the way of the Lord. That's one way to look at it. That the, that the law and the prophets, uh, the prophets and the law prophesied until John, meaning they prophesied of John. That was the last thing they prophesied of. That's one possible scenario of looking at this. The other way of looking at this is that all of the Old Testament were until John the Baptist. Because when you look at John the Baptist, he was the last Old Testament prophet. And then we have Jesus Christ, who at his death and resurrection, brought in the New Testament. Okay, So we see that John the Baptist, in that sense, is also the last of the Old Testament prophets. Now let's understand what's going on here, guys. Keep your finger there. Keep your finger there. Turn to Galatians chapter 3, please. This is a bit of a Bible study, but let's look at this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. 
So we know this is about the Old Testament. Verse 13 made that clear, okay? For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What is God's purpose for the law? What is God's purpose for the commands and the laws that God has given us in the Old Testament? It's, it's found here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. It says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Now let me just quickly talk about a false doctrine that's out there. Some people say that the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament prophets were saved by works. They were saved by keeping the law. That's such a ridiculous teaching because we know that no flesh can be saved by keeping the law. And verse number 21 makes it clear, right? It said there, for if there had been a law which could have given life, meaning that no man of law keeping can give anybody any life. Okay, let's keep reading verse number 22. But the scripture have concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Hey, how do we get the gift of faith? Or how, how do we believe? How, how, do we, how, do we, uh, how are we no longer under sin? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now look at this, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So what is the purpose of the law, of the prophets and the law? What's the purpose of the Old Testament? It's just that we see ourselves as sinners. Okay, We see ourselves as sinners. It's the schoolmaster that will bring us to Christ. Because it's when you realize that you're a sinner, when you realize you've come short of the glory of God, that's the point when you realize, I need a savior. I, I, I need Jesus Christ. He died for me. It's a free gift. It's by faith. Great. This is good news. I'm going to believe on him. All right. Say, so what does this have to do about the violent taking it by force? We'll get there. All right. Turn to Genesis 21 now. Genesis 21 verse 25. Genesis 21 verse 25. I just want to compare scripture with scripture here. Because a lot of people struggle with that verse, okay? But I believe I have the answer now. So I want to, tell you, I want to show, tell you guys what that is. Go to Genesis 21 verse 25. Because when we compare Scripture with Scripture, it really helps us understand some maybe cryptic words or, or cryptic uh, verses in the Bible. Genesis 21 verse 25. Now look at this. And Abraham reproved Abimelech. Now just quick history. Abimelech was the king that wanted to marry Abraham's wife. And Abraham kind of lied and said, oh, that's my sister. They, they, it was his half-sister or something like that, okay? But that's Abimelech. And then now they want to they wanna have peace, okay? They want to they wanna have a covenant between the two of them. It says, and Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. Hey, that kind of sounds like what we saw before about the, the violent take it by force, the kingdom of heaven by force. Okay, do you notice here that Abimelech's servants had violently taken away a well of water that Abraham wanted to use for his, you know, for his servants, for his flocks. And if you get the context of this, the reason why Abraham's um, upset about this is because Abraham himself dug this well. It was Abraham's well. And Abimelech's servants had tried to take it away had, uh, or, you know, from, from, uh, from uh, Abraham. So what I want to explain to you there is violently taking something away was... Something that belonged to someone, and then they stole that away. And the Bible uses the words violently taken away. Can you guys turn to Leviticus now? Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and look at this, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which... He, was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in, any, or in a thing taken away by violence, or have deceived his neighbor. So we have here in Leviticus some other sins, some other crimes that can be committed. And if, if your neighbor's given you something, but you've taken that away, you've stolen that away, it's something the neighbor cannot use. Did you notice that it said, or, or, or in a thing taken away by violence? Taken away by violence, okay? Because the word violence means violate. You know, when you steal something from someone, you have violated that person. They cannot use 
that object that they once had, you've violently taken that away. Now go to the book of Deuteronomy, please. Deuteronomy chapter 16, or 28, sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 28, you're not far from there. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 31. I just want to show you the consistency of the Bible, and then we'll go back to Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 11. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 31. Now look at this. And by the way, Deuteronomy chapter 28 starts off by God blessing Israel. God says to Israel, if you keep my commands, if you follow after me, then I'm going to bless you. Okay? But then he says to Israel, if you disobey my commands, you break my commands, you move away from me, then I'm going to curse you. What we're reading here in verse uh, 31 is part of that curse. Part of the curse that God would put upon the people of Israel. And it says here in verse 31, Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass, that's your donkey, shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. So do you notice there that part of the curse of God is that a man's uh, 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 donkey there shall be violently taken away. Okay. Now let me just, just think about this, guys. You know, we've gone through that exercise for a reason. Do you think when someone violently takes something away, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. Okay. Someone's stealing something that belongs to another. It's a curse of God, as it were, as well. Okay. And so we definitely see that as a negative thing. Go back to Matthew 11, please. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Now, I'm going to read to you from another passage, a parallel passage in the book of Luke. I'm just going to read to you from Luke 16, verse 16. Once I've read this, we can start putting it all together. Luke 16, verse 16. It's very similar. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Okay, let's under, Luke 16, 16 is easier to understand. Okay, let's look at this. It says that the law and the prophets were until John, so we know it's from the days of John the Baptist, since that time the kingdom of God is preached. Why? Because when John the Baptist came on the scene, Israel was in a really dark spiritual place. Okay, they were an ungodly, rebellious people. It's John the Baptist that came and prepared a new generation to follow after Christ, to serve Christ, to believe on Christ. This is why John the Baptist is so important in the New Testament. All right? Now it says, when the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. You see, here's the truth of the, of the Bible. Every man wants to go into the kingdom of God. Every man wants to be saved. Every man wants to know, how can I make myself right with God? And as soul winners, you're going to say, no, that's not true. Because I knock on their doors and they say, I'm not interested. Look, that's what they ignorantly say to you, that they are not interested. But the honest truth is, they would want nothing more than to know exactly what they must do to be saved. Okay, so the Bible said there in Luke 16, every man presses against it, yeah, into it. Everyone wants to know. Okay, and, and this is why it's so important that we be people that preach the gospel, because people out in our community want to know how do I make sure I enter the kingdom of God. But what has Satan done? Satan set up his false religions, the false gospels, the works-based gospels, the other gospels, the other Jesuses, the other spirits. You know, the other so-called Christian churches that are leading people to hell. Okay, but notice every man wants to know what do I need to do to go to heaven? The devil and his minions, you know, make sure that it's, it's clouded. It's difficult to understand. So when you go back to Matthew 11, let's understand this now. Matthew 11, verse 12. Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence... And the violent take it by force. What's going on here? If we have John the Baptist wanting to preach the gospel, what do we have? We have violent people. And if you've read your gospels, you know who these people are. It's the Pharisees. It's the Sadducees. It's the scribes. It's the rulers. The people in authority. The people that uh, were leaders in temples, in synagogues. These were the violent that would take away the kingdom of heaven from those that are trying to press in to know the truth. You see, this is the battle that we all have, guys. We have the truth of the word of God. 
Every man wants to know it, okay? And I, it's up to you. Are you going to take it to your community or not? Because here's what's going on. You've got the, the Jehovah Witnesses. You've got the Mormons. You've got everyone else out there trying to get their gospel out, as it were. You know, they're, 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 they're violently taking away that kingdom and, then, and they're replacing it with something else. They're replacing it with something difficult. They're placing it, replacing it with something evil, okay? So they, they will be blinded from the truth of God's word. So this is how I understand that verse, if you guys have been wondering, is that, hey, these people are working against John the Baptist, against John the Baptist. And, and you'll know that. If you've read your, your gospel, you, you'll know that there are plenty of people trying to blind the eyes of, of uh, people that are wanting to trust on Jesus Christ. It's the same today. Back in uh, Matthew 11, verse 14, Matthew 11, verse 14 all right, better hurry up. <laughs> Matthew 11, verse 14. And Jesus says, And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, that's Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears, let him hear. Uh, sorry, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So I won't go, I, I had a whole thing here, but basically just very, just very quickly to summarize this. John the Baptist did not recognize himself as the fulfillment of prophecy, as, as Elijah coming before. I'll read it to you quickly. In, in, uh, in Malachi 4.5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Actually, this is really important. Let me touch on this point, okay? Why was John the Baptist so important before Christ came? It just said it there in Malachi 4, 5, 5, uh, verse 6. It says, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. You know what? If John the Baptist did not come before Christ, Christ would have turned up and be like, look at this wicked nation. He's going to smite them with a curse. It's just going to destroy the nation of Israel because their hearts were so darkened, were so turned against the Lord that the Lord would just come and smite them with a curse. This is why John the Baptist had to come as a forerunner and get a new people prepared to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. The Bible in the Old Testament calls John the Baptist Elijah. And we know that Elijah in the Old Testament was a prophet. But then when Elijah is asked the question, are you Elijah? He says, no. But then when Jesus says, Jesus says, yep, that was Elias. That, that was, I mean, yeah, that was Elias, which was to come. Now, that's not to say that Elijah got reincarnated. Okay? It's not like Elijah was back physically in that form. Okay? But that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He was very similar to Elijah. Okay? Where if people knew Elijah and they saw John the Baptist, they go, man, this is, this is like the same guy. You know, have you ever, you know, has anyone ever said to you, you know, you remind me of, of such and such. You remind me of, of this person. You remind me of that person. It's kind of the same thing. I remember when I went, went to um, one of my old churches, Victory Baptist Church, like the first time I went there, you know, I didn't know anybody. And uh, there was a lady that just kept looking at me, just kept looking at me. I'm like, why is she looking at me? At the end of the service, she came up to me and said, can I just ask who your parents are? So I gave my parents' name. I go, I knew it. <laughs> I knew that you were the son of, you know, Ernesto, you know. And she only knew me as a, like she knew me as a little baby. I've never met this lady before, before that, you know. She knew me as a little baby, but for some reason, I don't know, my, my appearance or my mannerism reminded her of, of my dad, of, of, you know, of my father. So it's kind of the same thing. When John the Baptist came on the scene, it's not like he was Elijah reincarnated. It's just that he was so similar to Elijah. And so he came in that same spirit and the same power of Elijah. But yeah, I had a whole other thing to cover there. We'll move on. Verse number 16, please. Matthew 11, verse 16. And uh, uh, this is another passage of Scripture that I've never really been able to uh, really grab a hold of. What, what's it saying there? But I, I, again, I have an answer now. It says, verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. And if you're looking at that going, what is that about? Then, yeah, that's where I was, okay? But the next verses kind of help us understand that. Look at verse number 18. He goes, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, okay, these are those that take the kingdom of heaven violently by force, those Pharisees, those Sadducees, whatever they were, it's them, okay? For they say, he hath a devil. Say, so why did they say that John the Baptist had a devil? Because this guy was in the wilderness, he wasn't eating and drinking. He was eating the locusts. Okay? He was a wild man. And, and these people would say, he's of the devil. But look at verse 19. 
the Son of Man, referring to Jesus Christ himself, he goes, came eating and drinking. Hey, I, I, I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm invited to feast. I'm going in and eating. I'm drinking. And they say, what do they say about Jesus? Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. So they criticized John the Baptist because he, he was without. He wasn't feasting. He wasn't eating and drinking, right? He was in the wilderness. But Jesus Christ comes, and you know the stories. Many times he's invited into people's houses. They're feasting, they're eating, he's eating, he's drinking, you know. And they criticize Jesus. You know, they say he's gluttonous. They say, you know, he eats too much or he's a wine bibber. He's a drunkard, they say about him. Okay, these are false accusations made about Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ is saying here, it's kind of like for some people, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, is what he's saying. Okay, it doesn't matter what John the Baptist was like. They would still criticize him. Jesus comes, you know, doing things differently. They criticize him. Okay, now if we backtrack there in verse number 17, just to help us understand that, and saying, we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. It's like these people are never satisfied, okay? They, they pipe, they play music, but you're not dancing, okay? It's like, John, it's like John the Baptist, why aren't you eating and drinking, you know? And you're not doing it. And then to Jesus, why are you eating and drinking, okay? They're, they're being critical. It doesn't matter what they do. They're never satisfied with, with, uh, with, with the response of the people of God. And what, the only thing that I want to take out of this passage, just for your, for, for your understanding, is you can't make everybody happy. Okay, and this is a, a realization that I've learned as a pastor, okay, of a church obviously in Queensland and here. I just had to realize, you know, I, I, I love you guys. <laughs> I, I do. I love the brethren. You know, I, I don't travel down from Queensland every week just for myself, okay. I do it for you guys. I really do love you. But I realize that I can't make everybody happy, okay. And I just have to make sure that I'm doing what God has asked me to do. I've got to make sure that I just preach the word of God. All right, and if you pipe and I don't dance, well, so be it. All right, that's just the way it is. Like, you can't make everybody happy. And that's what Jesus Christ is saying that these guys are just never satisfied. No matter how the, the prophets of God act or behave, they will never accept the prophets of God. Okay, let's keep reading verse number 20. Now, this is really important, okay? Because before I, before I read that, I'll just say to you guys have you, ever, have you ever been told by people, you know, shouldn't Christ, they'll say, shouldn't Christians be like, Toler to like, shouldn't they have tolerance? That they, they say, doesn't Christianity teach tolerance? Okay, because here's the thing. We preach against abortions. We preach against homosexuality. We preach against sins. Okay, we, we preach against things that, that God teaches us. And people will say, well, where's your tolerance? Doesn't Christianity teach tolerance? And you know what? It does teach tolerance. It does. But it's right here in this passage. Let's look at it. What does Jesus Christ teach? Verse number 20, then began he to abrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. So you see, Christ was going around cities doing great works, but many of them would not repent. Many of them would not believe on Christ. Look what it says in verse 21. Woe unto you, uh, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. Hey, these are Jewish cities. These are Jewish towns. Jesus says to them, woe unto you. For if the mighty works which were done to you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, Tyre and Sidon, if you don't know, these are Gentile cities. So he's saying, woe to you Jewish cities, because if I did these works in these Gentile cities, they would have repented. Okay? And you guys know you've not done that. Okay? And then it says in verse 22, But I say unto you, now here's the word, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. There's the tolerance. Now, let me just read to you quickly from Luke 6, 17. I'll just read this to you very quickly. And he came, this is talking about Jesus, and he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, so that's the Jews, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, that's the Gentiles, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. So this is true. You know, Jesus did not go uh, to the Gentile cities. He was focused on Jerusalem and Judea. But when the Gentiles heard of Jesus Christ, they were like, we've got to go and see him. We've got to go. And, and they went to hear him. They were healed of their diseases. 
This is true. Jesus Christ was able to do um, mighty works amongst the Gentiles as well. So he's criticizing these Jewish cities where they have Jesus Christ there. And he says, look, it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Hey, look, there's coming a time when every man is going to be judged by God. Now, if you're a believer, praise God, you're not going to be judged for your sins. You're not going to be judged for rejecting Christ. Okay, You're going to be judged for the works that you've done for Christ and Christ will reward you. Okay? You're not going to have to answer for your sins because Jesus Christ already nailed those sins on the cross 2,000 years ago. Okay? The, your past, present, and future sins. You know, Praise God, we're not going to be judged for our sins. We will be judged by our works. Okay? So try to make sure your works are, have eternal value. Okay? It's going to matter when you stand before God. But for the non-believing, they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment of God. They will also be judged by the works. Say, why are they going to be judged by their works? Because they believe they can be saved by their works. They believe, hey, I'm a good person. I've done my best for God. And God's going to judge their so-called goodness next to the law of God, next to the perfection of God. And they're going to come short. Okay, They're going to come short and they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But notice that on the day of judgment for the non-believing cities, it's going to be more tolerable for some than for others. Okay, meaning that hell is not this equal place. Okay, it's not like equal suffering in hell. For those that had the greater opportunity, those, these people in these cities where Christ did his amazing works, but they still rejected him, it's going to be more tolerable for the city that didn't have Christ there, okay, and, and they still didn't believe, but because they've had the works done, they're going to suffer a more terrible punishment. Okay, it's going to be more tolerable for the ones that uh, didn't have the opportunities as other people. Now, I want you to consider this. Uh, you know, this is really important because, you know, I have children. Many of you guys have your own children. You know, we go to church. We grow up into church. Our children go to church. And I want you to make sure you never neglect your children. Okay, I've been in church my whole life. How many times have I seen children go up into teenagers they want nothing to do with church? You know, how many children do I see grow up and want nothing to do with Christ. They grow up and they're not even saved. Okay? They've had the opportunity to hear the gospel. They maybe heard it week in and week out. Sometimes parents, we, we let down our kids. We think, oh, we'll just bring them to church and they're going to get it. No. Parents, we need to invest our time into our children. Because if our children hear the gospel, they come to church, they hear the good news, but they don't believe it, they reject it, reject it, reject it. Hey, they might get to a point when they stand before God and it's going to be more tolerable for others than it is for them. Okay, it's really, really important. Let's keep reading verse number 23. And thou Capernaum, this is another Jewish city, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. So we know this judgment is the judgment to hell here. Okay, They were brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which were have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. We know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know that Christ rained down fire and brimstone on these cities okay, and destroyed them, okay, that reprobate city. But, you know, before they got to that point, Christ says, if I came and did the works in Sodom, they would have repented okay, before they got to that point of rejection to Christ. Okay? And look, I mean, how bad is Sodom and Gomorrah? And yet for Capernaum, it's going to be worse. For the non-believers in Capernaum, their suffering in hell is going to be worse than for those that die, that perished in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we see, yes, the Bible teaches tolerance. But it's about hell. Okay? It's how bad, you know, how tolerable will hell be for some people. You know, for those that were, you know, you know, exceedingly wicked, for those that had the opportunities but they still rejected Christ, hey, their suffering in hell is going to be so much worse than for others that maybe just ignorantly went about life, you know, whatever, and, uh, and, and died a relatively re reasonable person, I suppose, they're still going to hell, but they're not going to suffer. They, it's going to be more tolerable for them than it is for those that had the opportunity. Let's keep reading verse number 25. Verse number 25. And uh, at this time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast, re and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So the wise and prudent that Jesus is speaking of here, that was obviously that generation that is critical of John the Baptist, critical of Jesus Christ. But he says, look, the Father has allowed this to be revealed unto babes. Hey, why, what, what's he talking about? You see, 
for us to receive Christ, for us to know what the Word of God says. Okay, We can't be wise and prudent in our own eyes. We can't be that way. We've got to be like babes. We've got to have the humility of little children. And you know, parents, you tell your child something and they'll believe you. You know, children aren't there kind of wondering, you know, dad said this, is that true? Is that No, if you tell your children something, they'll just believe it. Okay, it's the same thing. When we learn about the gospel, all of us, if you've been saved, all of us had to get to a point of humility and go, well, that's the word, what the word of God says. That's what it says. I guess I have to believe on Christ. I realize that I can't be wise and prudent. I can't be puffed up. I can't be prideful. I can't get myself to heaven. I have to lower myself and accept what Christ has done unto me. Hey, but this is the same thing. Even after you're saved, you know, even as a preacher, when I study my Bible to bring your sermon, I've got to come as a little babe, okay? Because it gets things get revealed to babes. Things get revealed to those that have humility. If I come here trying to impress you with my wisdom and, and my understanding and my, and my studies, that's not what it's about. You know, I'm trying to come and preach the Word of God to you, and I try to come with humility. Because, you know, I've got a fear, like, as far as God is concerned, you're like the best people in the world. You're like, you're like, you're the best people, okay? You're the children of God. And God says to me, can you feed my children? Right? I mean, think about how scary that is. Like for a minute, if you kind of think about that, right? Put it this way. And you probably don't even care about the Queen of England, but let's say you were a chef and, and you were hired to cook a meal for the Queen of England. Okay. And you were just, you probably don't care because you're a believer. You're like, whatever. Okay. But if you were just a worldly person, you're like, you're going to be nervous, aren't you? You're going to be afraid. You're going to be, you're going to be like, man, I hope this person, you know, enjoys my cooking. I hope I don't, I hope I don't mess it up. Hey, when I come preaching to you, it's the same thing. You know, the word of God is, is the food of the spirit. It's, it's the bread. Okay. It's a bread for the spirit. And when I come preparing a sermon, it's the same thing. I, I know you guys in God's eyes are the most important people in the world. Okay, you're his children, and he's like, can you feed them, please? I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I realize now just how important the job is as a pastor, as a preacher, okay? But the only way I'm going to get the, the wisdom of God, the insight, and the food to feed your spirits is by being obeyed, by being humble and hearing from the Word of God. Let's keep reading verse number uh, 27, and we'll just, we'll just wrap it up now, but uh, verse 27, I won't expand too much on these verses. It says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. You see, the only way to the Father, the only way to the Father is through the Son, through the Son, by, through Jesus Christ. And of course, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, these, these Jews, these people that rejected Christ, they wanted to make it to the Father, but they didn't want to do it through the Son. Jesus Christ was coming, doing great works, you know, teaching them great things, offering Himself, and they still rejected Him. And He's just reminding, hey, without me, without the Son, you're not going to make it to the Father. Let's keep reading verse 28. And this is the promise for us, guys. This is the promise for us, okay? Verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay? So first thing, if we want to apply this to salvation, again, how many people say you've got to labor to get saved? You've got to do the, hard, the good works. You've got to try really hard. You've got to try to stop sinning. You've got to go to church. You've got to get baptized. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to keep that sacrament. You've got to keep that sacrament. No. Okay? Laboring to heaven is not going to get you there. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, salvation has been completely paid for by the works of Jesus Christ. All that's required from us is to rest in Him, to rest in the, in the work that He has done. And once you've done that, once you've been saved, verse 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you. Okay, What's a yoke? Something that, that, uh, that puts two things together. Jesus Christ wants to work with us. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how do I serve the Lord? How do I do the works that God has left me to do? Is it going to require a lot of my time? Is it going to require a lot of my effort? No, his yoke is easy, okay? His burden is light, okay? All you need to do, guys, is spend time with the Lord. 
All you need to do is be, be praying, okay? Be speaking to the Lord. All you need to do is open His Word and read the Bible, okay? All you need to do is come to church and sit down and praise the Lord and, and, and listen to preaching. Now, all you have to do, and this is the hardest part, is go out there and preach the gospel to this lost and dying world. Yes, it's a little hard on the body sometimes, okay? But really, you're repeating the same great news, you know, that you've received, that you've enjoyed receiving, uh, and you're, you're, you're just um, feeding that to other people, okay? So the yoke of God is easy. He doesn't want us, you know, laboring hard. Look, Jesus done all the hard work. And when, you, when he asks you to labor with him, he says, it's a yoke. You're working with him. You're learning from him, okay? So I hope that gives you a good understanding of Matthew chapter 11. If there's anything that um, I felt like I skipped for a lot of things that I had prepared, just to save time. But if there's any questions, if you feel like I haven't covered something clearly enough, please let me know after the service. Okay, let's pray.